Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here for Knut Asmus and that we can join the seminar. It was exciting for me to really look look above uh, my experiences in the last couple of weeks when I've been joining. And now I see we are just coming from the uh, topic of gold nanowatts and we'll now move to gold nanospheres. Knut gave the title probing the electronic absorption spectrum of single gold nanoparticles in the gas phase. This is something we do at the University of Leipzig. And we are a team of four people in the moment for single nanoparticle experiments with Knut Asmus, the group leader, um, Sophia Leipe and Cleopatra Papra Gregorio as PhD and master students. I mentioned my ex-colleague Benjamin Hoffman here, who did the experiments that I'm presenting today. And currently our project is funded by an individual research grant by the German Research Foundation. Now, our vision is to develop a toolbox to do single nanoparticle experiments in the gas phase. And at the heart is here the cross section of an iron trap in the center where we can keep, where we can store a single nanoparticle up to weeks in some experiments we did last year. And then we have different mirrors and optical paths and large optical access to then see the particle from Rayleigh scattering. And so now our vision is to use this platform to develop different approaches uh, to manipulate and analyze the nanoparticle surface, where at the heart for our approach is mass spectrometry, which do optically. And then we have additional laser access for UV vis spectroscopy uh, infrared spectroscopy. Like two years ago, we replaced the camera by a spectrometer setup. So we can also apply fluorescent spectroscopy and then using fundamentally heat control by a cryostat in which we mount the trap. I just see I should activate the pointer. And um, we then also want to go forward to techniques like temperature program desorption on a single nanoparticle in the trap. Now, in the next 20 minutes, I would like to explain you more what's our basic measurement principle that we call single nanoparticle action spectroscopy. In the context of the seminar, I should probably call it photothermal spectroscopy, an indirect uh, technique where we use the heat development upon absorption. And then I will show you our first proof of principle experiments for dyed silica nanoparticles that we actually do see the correct shape of an absorption spectrum before I move to the title topic on plasmonic resonances of a single gold particle. Now, the next slide is probably familiar to all of you, but it puts into context what was our initial motivation to develop these techniques. It's looking at nanoparticle speed in, in the atmosphere and technical applications like chemical catalysis or sensing applications. Uh, they suffer chemical and physical inhomogeneity in large samples. And if we do classical absorption spectroscopy, uh, the results that suffer inhomogeneous broadening and what uh, has been highlighted um, sometime in December. No, I, it was by David Masiello was that actually the extinction that is measured is the sum of absorption and scattering. So if we go to larger nanoparticles, uh, the measurements will be dominated by scattering and it can be pretty hard uh, to really access the absorption cross sections. Now, there is a nice toolbox, which many of you do yourself of single nanoparticle techniques, but then we have seen exceptions, but mostly they rely on surface deposition previous to the measurements. And our approach is now to, to do a similar thing in the gas phase and to do single nanoparticle action spectroscopy to really assess the intrinsic properties of those particles in the absence of any support and to get started with a technique that is really intrinsically sensitive to absorption only. The experimental setup is relatively simple. We start from nanoparticles in solution, use electron spray ionization to transfer them to vacuum, have some guiding to move them into a split wing 
um, electro trap and then with some high pressures to decelerate the particles, we, we can slow them down and then really trap a single one or do some dis dis uh, destabilization. And then from this moment on, we really focus only on the trap setup. I had shown uh, this graph before, and I should maybe quickly present to you how this looks in reality. Um, the sketch on the right hand side, we have three pairs of electrodes. The blue and red is used for the radio frequency to trap a particle in the center. It's a pole trap like potential that uh, we create with these specially shaped electrodes. And then we have the green pair to do some resonant excitation of the particle movement in the trap. And these outer wing holders of these electrodes can be seen here as the metal parts in between the uh, illuminated spaces on the image of the left-hand side. Now, having a single particle in the trap, it will move forth and back here, not the light, nice images we have seen by Pavan Kruma of the optical tweezers, but this movement forth and back uh, will give us a secular frequency if we measure this, which is then proportional to the mass to charge ratio that we use to do a mass spectrometry. Now, there are a couple of different methods to do that. We typically use this third pair of electrodes to do some resonant excitation. I do a very schematically cartoon top wide. And if we have larger particle motion, it will have uh, less illumination time, or in fact, for us, it's less time in the region of interest that we actually visualize. And then sweeping through the frequency around the secular frequency of the particle, we will see here on, on the y-axis, a dip in the photon signal we see, which gives us the opportunity to, for each sweep once, determine uh, the resonance frequency. And then at the beginning of each, after trapping a single nanoparticle, the beginning of each experiment, we do some charge stepping, which uh, results here the left and axis in the frequency steps, which are the magenta crosses. And if we do it often enough, we can extractable, extrapolate to the, ab, um, to the absolute charge and thus really determine absolute mass, which is seen here in the face of the charge stepping had been unchanged. Now, once we are settled to do mass spectrometry, we can use the cryostat on which the trap is mounted on and use the cryogenic cooling to add some gases in, in the collision gas in the ion trap that will adsorb at specific temperatures to the surface. And then we can use a second line for spectroscopy laser. And if we hit the particle at the wavelength where it absorbs, the absorbed energy will eventually be transferred into heat. And we can then detect the light absorption because the heat uh, will lead to evaporation of the um, surface adsorbed particles. And then we can see the mass loss by the mass spectrometry. I had shown this formula again that extinction is the sum of absorption and scattering. So especially in solution, with phase spectroscopy for large particles, the scattering cross-sections will dominate and it will be very hard. And with our indirect technique, it's really easy to measure the absorption cross-section because we are only sensitive to the absorption with, with the heat generation. And it's even easier for us to measure the large particles because the larger the, cross, the scattering cross-section is, the easier it is to uh, detect the particles by light to perform the mass spectrometry. Now we can through, uh, scan through a laser, which is in the center here, for instance, from 800 to 400 nanometers in the full, full visible range and back again. And then to keep a constant surface coverage, to have similar conditions uh, throughout scanning the spectrum, we typically switch the laser on and off. You can see it in the zoom in cartoon on top. And then switching it on and off at a resonant wavelength will result in a large um, maximum and minimum mass difference. And then you can see here already that a buried in the envelope will be the full absorption spectrum, which is now scanned in both directions in the scheme here. So the first uh, 
question for us was, is the absorption spectrum we see or whether the mass difference spectrum then actually proportional to the true absorption of the particles we investigate. And so first proof of principle experiments were done using a transparent silica nanoparticles at 100 nanometer diameter and measuring a stained with blue and red dye particles throughout the full spect uh, spectral range and then comparing it to solution spectra. You see the full, almost the full results on the right hand slide. The right axis is the absorption cross section measured. Well, we measured the full extinction in solution and then subtracted the me simulated scattering cross section, which is the dominant part and up at a, uh, end up with a black line, which then shows the subtracted solution absorption spectrum. And then for the blue and red particles, you see the blue and red markers from the actually action uh, spectroscopy experiments on a single nanoparticle each, repeating it a few times and averaging. And you see a very nice agreement of the spectra with the solution spectra, except for at the high wavelength side, where we see some redshift of the solution spectra, which is compared to the cryogenically single nanoparticle experiments explained by the room temperature excitation. So we are seeing some hot bands uh, at the uh, wet shifted side of the spectrum. Now, having settled that we can actually measure an absorption spectrum, we moved on to plasmonic noble metal particles of 50 nanometer size, which by the enhanced scattering are easily to see for us even if they're somewhat somewhat uh, smaller than the silica particle. This was a very nice system for us to get started. And probably just a short reminder to most in the audience, this here is a typical absorption spectrum of a metal nanoparticle. And at the low wave numbers, high energy, uh, this is dominated by interband transitions where single photon absorption even directly creates an electron hole pair. And we would like to focus here on this resonance on the right hand side, which is due to a collective motion of the con conductance band electrons called the localized plasma surface resonance. I think many of you know better about it than I do. And all the, of the rest of us may have seen the stained church windows from colloidal solutions, which can be photostable up to hundreds of years. I would like to dedicate one slide on work from the Link Group, and Stefan Link is here on the audience um, to speak about chemical interface damping. Now, having this plasma excitation in, in a single nanoparticle, there are different decay channels by sc scattering uh, with phonons or defect sites or other electrons in, in the particle. And, most notably for us, they can scatter with an induced dipole due to an adsorbate of the surface. Now, our technique uh, intrinsically depends on having adsorbing messenger molecules or wear gas atoms on the surface. So we definitely induce the chemical interface damping and then can use it as a platform to use different messenger tags to see how different species on, on the surface will really determine this chemical interface damping. Now, the effect on the absorption spectrum has been nicely shown, shown in the sketch here, going from gray without surface adsorbance to full coverage with the orange signal, and then uh, distinguishing this into different effects, we see an intensity loss, a shift of the resonant uh, peak position, and uh, forward half maximum broadening. I will add another nice sketch, which I liked a lot to show why single particle imaging is important in this context, where just as an example showing three slightly different shapes of gold nanowatts, one can have three different uh, central, central absorption peaks. And if they are now mixed in, in a, a theoretical uh, number density shown on top here, 
when we'll end up with a gray line, which is a broadening, which is so large that the small difference from the chemical interface damping would be completely lost. So single particle experiments are key here. And what we are doing is to try to repeat for this system, some of these experiments, which have been done very successfully on, on, with surface to position experiments, we want to do it in a gas phase. And here you see our first, publish, first published results of 50 nanometer gold particles. This was performed at a trap temperature at 100 Kelvin and a two micro bar pressure of nitrogen. And only in the retrospect, we could realize that actually there were oxygen impurities, which were the actual messenger molecule that we use to take the absorption spectra, and then taking the average of H spectra in the end took about 12 hours of measurement time. Now, a naive idea before we got started was to, to have these gold nanoparticles as hydrate or PV, PVS stabilized in, in, solu in um, solution with water. And then if we would spray this into the vacuum and trap it, we of course ideally would like to have uh, the naked nanoparticle, which most likely is not true. But we hope that we can use the laser heating uh, to really evaporate any contaminants on the surface. So let's see what the experimental results tell us. And you see on the left-hand side, the black diamonds, which are averages over eight spectra. The, the um, gray area is the, the envelope of the one sigma of the eight measurements. And then we see this pronounced absorption from the plasma resonance. But if, if we ask a simple me theory for spherical particles, for pure gold without surface cover, which we would expect uh, the dashed line. And I have seen the same shift uh, for silver spectra on surfaces, when silver had been deposited on the surface and the surface had been moved uh, in, in an atmosphere. And now in our case, we know by now that we had oxygen adsorbed to the surface. And Benjamin Hoffman didn't know it at this time when he was playing around with different compositions of and thicknesses of surface layers, and then could from the simple me simulations get the black curve by assuming there is some gold oxide layer of about five nanometers, which is 10% of the radius on top and come um, close to the actual measured, measured spectrum. So we hope that we could see the influence of different sizes of just the dispersity of the 50 nanometer control we had. Benjamin did this with different surface stabilizers. So with, with or without the assets on the surface and basically always saw the same spectrum, which is now here on the right hand side presented for a single nanoparticle um, after different heating phases. And we see the blue, yellow, green is hardly changed at all. The width is pretty much the same. Maybe after 150 milliwatt heating, there's a small reductance of, of the amplitude. And then finally, he was heating at high temperature for a very long time and could completely quench the plasma resonance. So in our publication, this is an open question. What, what happened here? Maybe the surface layer has changed by the heat. Perhaps we were heating enough to completely deform the gold particle and maybe oxidize it throughout, which would explain the vanishing of the plasma resonance. But so far we haven't achieved simulations where we really can reproduce uh, the line shape that we get from the experiments. So at the current state, we want to Oh, I wanted to skip one slide, but I still have enough time here. So this was our initial idea. And then in the light of the experimental results we have, we rather, rather have to think about there are still surfactants that we got from the solution and did not evaporate away during the transfer in the vacuum. We know that we have oxygen, nitrogen and water and probably other species around and they could maybe undergo some chemical changes that can additionally be driven by heat. And this is something to be investigated in the future. 
So when repeating these experiments, we want to do it with a more controlled atmosphere than before. We try to better understand the initial surface preparation to derive hopefully some heating schemes to get a, a reproducible starting point. And then we hope that this way we can probe the chemical interface damping in the gas phase. So this was really a bit our first real life system. We are still mainly in the phase of method development and characterization and seeing what are the next target systems that we can do to step-by-step step in, in, increment our experimental capabilities. And then I think I have time to show a little bit what we've been doing last year, which is really to understand in detail the charging and decharging, to have control of the charge state of these particles, to start to becoming quantitative with understanding adsorption and desorption dynamics, to finally hopefully estimate binding energies, which crucially depends on surface temperature. And we had a first partial success to use fluorescent thermometry to really measure the surface temperature in situ. And we would like also to move forward from visible spectroscopy to infrared spectroscopy, which is directly sensitive to ligands at the surface. Now I have shown our current nanoparticle team uh, from the group already. Some more group members are shown here. I would like to briefly mention Tim Esser who built up this experiment in our group and also acknowledge the work by Dieter Gerlich, Stefan Schlemmer and Scott Anderson who had the preliminary ideas and implementations of these techniques. And in particular, Scott Anderson who is still active and uh, doing that cryogenic, but heating experiments and sublimation experiments actively help us to co construct and, and improve our experiment. With this, I would like to conclude with my overview slide. I hope I have made you understand our approach to single nanoparticle action spectroscopy could convince you that it actually does the right thing to measure absorption spectra showing it from the dyed silica particles and giving you a first glimpse what we hope we can make accessible for us in single nanoparticle gas phase experiments with the toolbox we are currently developing and seeing some obstacles, but being also motivated with the first results that we could obtain on a single gold particle. And with this, I think we can move in the question session then also opening up for the other speakers after a while. Yes, Björn, thank you very much for this report about an interesting new technique, measure absorptions. And there's already the first hand uh, appearing by Pama. Okay. Yeah, yeah. very, very interesting uh, uh, work. Uh, in, in the context of the plasmonic uh, resonance quenching, would you would you find any kind of time dependent fluctuations in your spectrum? Uh, because of course you would probably be doing this at a very uh, at a very small scale, meaning you will have to integrate over a long period of time. Would mm -hmm. you uh, do do you observe any kind of time dependency? Because uh, in principle, if you have these particles in vacuum. And if there are molecules which are absorbed and dissolved from these these particles, you should uh, uh, have some kind of interesting uh, effects kind of uh, in in the spectral features. Mm -hmm. uh, that, and, that's a curious. very yeah. That's a very nice question. At, at the current state, we were really doing these twelve hour experiments to take a single spectrum and then heating in between and coming back to steady state conditions and control the surface coverage and continue measuring. So I think a major obstacle is that we do heating for long interval is that we really cannot keep the surface coverage at the same time. So it will, will be challenging to do that. But I think once we understand better what we're doing, it's a very nice suggestion. We could, for instance, have a look, just take two uh, frequency points in the laser spectrum and just take the ratios. And then maybe, well, we have just two, two, well, three to four mass points per minute. 
but maybe we can improve a bit on this and then see at least on the scales and like five minute intervals, if we can more specifically somehow steer the particle away from the initial conditions and perhaps somehow observe also in time, how like some frequency ratio will change. But I'm not sure how much detail we, we can obtain there, but mm. I think I, I will keep it as one idea what we should should look at when we come back to these experiments this year. Yeah, maybe it might actually be a preamble to even, you know, uh, tracking reactions and other things on the surface, because there's a lot of yes. Yeah, catalysis and other things. Because tracking surface reactions for catalysis or that to understand more how silica dust particles in S2 chemistry could drive chemical reactions to produce more, more complex organic chemistry would, would be a very exciting topic. Well, then of course we will have to see how it works with the sensitivity. We say we do single particle techniques. This is nice. Now, if we, I think we, we expect a new, more stable frequency generator, but it will still be very hard or very slow to really see like a single water molecule dissolving from a huge mega Dalton particle. And then probably we need to average somehow over several reactions occurring on the surface. But this is definitely one way, uh, one path to go where I would be very excited. And since I've, I also started working in experiments from the uh, side of reaction dynamics and astrochemical reactions, I expect this to not happen in, in intermediate time scales and to be very difficult. But this was one of the first. Uh, First questions intriguing me when, when I moved to Leipzig to get started with these experiments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Michel has an additional question. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank, thank you for a very uh, nice talk, very original technique. I <clears throat> Maybe I didn't catch exactly what your experiment is on the on this. Uh, I mean, the, the, the graph is shown on the conclusion slide. Uh, so you, you get, uh, you lose the plasmon resonance when you get to the highest power. So is that measured while heating or after heating? This has been measured after the heating. OK, oh, yes, yes. Because this... obviously, if, if the particle is melting, then the plasma completely disappears. Right. It is, uh, yes, it is, exactly. Of course, the conduction and properties completely disappear when you melt. Uh, then at the... it becomes well, it, it will be frozen again in the 12 hours we're measuring afterwards. My, my current hypothesis would be that it's really completely melted at this long 250 milliwatt yeah, yeah. heating step. And so it can completely mix with the oxygen. And if it's oxidizing throughout, then also according to me theory, there's no a plasma yeah, yeah. scene anymore. And, and the related question is about uh, um, black body radiation. So I don't know if you have uh, looked into that with the... Mm -hmm. You know the fluorescence, or, or you can call it scattering, uh, sco uh, we, you know uh, Raman scattering, we, or whatever. We, we have not characterized black body radiation, but it's it's a great, it's a large topic for us because yes, we have yes. this huge topical access. So we have large contributions of room temperature black body radiation. We have extra uh, contributions of the first uh, cold shield. So we have different contributions and we hope that fluorescence thermometry will give us some means to somehow investigate this, but we are quite some, some way away from understanding this. But this is something we want to work on and come back to uh, doing some theory when we have better empirical data. The first attempts which have been made were just se several orders of magnitude off to understand what we are seeing. So the, this is one. Yeah, maybe in this context, it may, yes. it may be useful to uh, to discuss with uh, Yonatan Sivan in Israel, who is uh, mm -hmm. really uh, you know uh, proposing theories for for this kind of uh, emissions. Yes, thank you very much for that idea. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Other questions. So, so if you give here the powers for for the heating, to what temperatures do you actually heat the particle? Or can you get rid of the oxygen um, uh, maybe at some temperature as well? This is now something I have not looked into it yet, 
myself. I don't remember if, if Benjamin Hoffman did did it. And I think we don't give numbers in the paper, probably because he did the first simulations, which were just orders of magnitude off. And I think he didn't dare to publish it yet. Now, in the last year, we took more data really watching the adsorption during time. And I have not fully analyzed it yet, but in this context, I will try again if we can't really estimate the heating power and getting the temperatures and then correlate it to the absorption dynamics with argon at 60 Kelvin that we have measured. And I will hope that we can do the next step to become quantitative there and okay. then correlate it also to what has been happening here. And do you have any kind of access to the particle afterwards that you can deposit that on the substrate to have a look at uh, the particle in electron center to Wiebke, maybe? <laughs> yes, this, this was always a dream by Benjamin Hoffman who told me this is something you should do. I, I should speak to Wiebke, but so far I thought I can put a plate in. I Once I have the new radio frequency generator, I could perfectly plan like in which phase of the sine amplitude I will phase out. I would need to put some additional ion optics in behind, but then I will have it on a single surface, which I will take out well, after a week and I'm spraying into the same chamber, so it would be completely dirty. Uh, so far, I wouldn't be aware of any marker I could do to actually uh, uh, even have a chance to find this particle. Yes. So I never really followed this idea, but perhaps there are some neat tricks that I'm not aware of so far. Okay. 